and welcome to None of Your Business Podcast, where we bring you inspiring storytelling from the heart. I'm your host, Robert Talud. Thank you for joining me today. Now let the show begin. Hey guys, real quick, just go over to YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel for None of Your Business. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend. But most importantly, please go leave a rating and review either on YouTube or Apple or wherever you can. All right, guys. Thank you. I love you. Now, enjoy the episode. Well, if you are ready, then we will go. So welcome, Drew. I got Drew Manning on. Who is the fit to fat to fit to fit to fat? <laughs> I probably got that mixed up. But, so who it was are pretty you? good. And what do you it do? Was pretty good. Yeah. So most people know me as the fit to fat to fit guy, uh, which I started in 2011. So that was my idea of gaining weight on purpose as someone who has never been overweight a day in my life. And I was a personal trainer at the time. So I wanted to gain a better understanding of what it was like to be overweight because my clients were overweight and I had never been overweight and I couldn't understand why it was so hard for them just to follow the meal plans and the workouts. Like for me, it seems so simple and easy, but they tended to struggle being consistent. And so anyways, I went on this journey to better understand why is it so hard for people to just, you know, eat less food and work out. And I did this experiment where for six months, I let myself go completely, no exercise, ate a standard American diet, put on 75 pounds in six months, and it was truly humbled and realized just how wrong I was in my approach to helping people. And I, I didn't understand it before. I didn't understand how much of transformation is mental and emotional until I did that first experiment. Mm-hmm. And so my eyes were opened, learned a lot of valuable lessons. And that's kind of where I kind of made a name for myself because the story went viral. I went on like Jay Leno and Dr. Oz and Good Morning America and The View, wrote a book and the book Fit to Fat to Fit became a New York Times bestseller. And then from there, created a TV show called Fit to Fat to Fit as well, where we put other trainers through this process because it was so impactful and powerful. And uh, I came out of it so much more empathetic. And so that's what most people know me as. So let's talk about the empathy side of it. Mm-hmm. Like, what have you learned? Like, Yeah. So the first, the first lesson I learned was, you know, I, I went into my first Fit to Fat to Fit experiment thinking it was all going to be physical. I'll eat this yeah. many calories. I'll eat this much food. I'll gain this much weight. And then I'll lose it all. Right. Um, (laughs) And I started to realize as I was doing this, how much of it was mental and emotional, uh, both gaining the weight and losing the weight. And then I remember also um, trying to, when I tried to lose the weight, those first two weeks of eating healthy food again, after eating six months of like cinnamon toast crunch and like Mountain Dew and like hot pockets and top ramen and SpaghettiOs and all the delicious processed foods we have here in America, because they are Mm -hmm. delicious, I'll I'll be honest. Um, You know, after after gaining the 75 pounds in six months and and doing that, I remember eating healthy for the first time and it sucked. The food didn't taste as good. My body kind of fought back against me and almost wanted the food, the unhealthy food more than the healthy food because I had been feeding it that food for so long and it clicked for me. This is what my clients have been telling me. I would give them a meal plan, expect them to be perfect, And then their bodies are like, no, we want this stuff over here. And so it's almost like this, you know, they're getting pulled in a different direction where we think if you've never been overweight, it's just, you know, it's just willpower, just willpower your way through it and be disciplined and, you know, it'll be fine. Like you'll be able to do it. But after having that experience, I had so much more empathy for those that struggle with weight loss and body image because of how powerful the emotional connection to food really is. And that's where I finally, you know, learned that lesson of empathy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was reading the fit to fat to fit to fit uh-huh. fit to fat to tongue twister, right. <laughs> geez, um, uh-huh. I, uh, you know, when I was reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, like my diet is not perfect by any means. Uh-huh. It's it's not good. Like I just lift weights and eat it as much as I can. That's that is yeah. to be yeah, completely like, honest. Yeah, but on the mental side of it like i'm a recovering drug addict and like i was Mm -hmm. like oh my gosh those guys like your experience is so much similar to like me recovering yeah and it just clicked and like i never heard like somebody talk about a diet like that and nutrition 
Mm -hmm. um because now like i use a i use food as like a coping as a coping mechanism like and like i don't mean to but that's just like one addiction to another and for some reason while reading your book it just clicked like that and i was like oh my gosh (laughs) like holy and like when i first started lifting i was i had the same uh mindset as you was like well just you know if you want to work out just go work out yeah (laughs) um like overweight people are just lazy and like yeah. i would build resentments towards people yeah. um and doing that but i read definitely reading your book and you know working out on a regular basis like it, my mind sweat my mindset has changed so mm-hmm. one i appreciate you thank re- you uh, writing that like it helped me a lot um yeah i appreciate that and thank you for sharing that i didn't know that but i think it's really powerful um, you know, I think there's different types of um, addictions, and I think that all addictions cover some type of pain, and that's what people don't realize. And food can be an addiction because it does probably cover up some type of pain for most people, because they don't, you know, for some people they just don't reach out to towards drugs. They're like, no, this stuff is safe, it's legal, so I can eat all that I want. But then they're doing the same thing as drug addicts are doing because they're numbing some type of pain or distracting themselves from the pain of life or whatever they're going through. And food becomes those little dopamine hits that they get throughout the day, multiple times a day. And they're like, oh, well, at least I don't do drugs. And it's like, it's very similar um, that, you know, I work with people that, you know, with, uh, that struggle with weight loss and, and food addiction sometimes. And it's a very similar uh, mechanism in the brain of what's happening, of what they're doing to themselves, even though it's, you know, it, it might not be the exact same chemical reaction as, as drugs do, but it's a very similar reaction. And it's very hard to break because food is still legal. <laughs> you know, and it tastes really, really good. And we need it to survive. You need food. Um, but yeah, I have an issue with people when they look at people, you know, when I, like, I used to be the same way. I used to be judgmental towards people who were overweight. Like, dude, just eat less food and just work out. It's the same thing as going up to a drug addict and being like, dude, just stop doing drugs. Why don't you just stop doing, like, it's right. not that hard. Just do it. It's like, yeah, I would, I would if I could, but it's not that simple. Mm-hmm. Very similar with food addiction. And that's why I'm trying to you know, through these experiments is bring more awareness of the importance of empathy for those that struggle and the importance of how much of a mental and emotional journey this is for them to break free from this. It's not as simple as just willpowering their way because willpower doesn't really work for most people. I'll be honest with you, it really doesn't. So anyways, thank you for sharing that and letting me talk a little bit about that. No, no, uh, of course. Thank you. So now like you did the fit to fit to fat to fit. Now you're doing it again. Yeah. What yes. have you learned that, um, what have you learned different this time? What are some new mm-hmm. lessons or some lessons that you brought into this? Yeah, good question. So I kind of went into the, my second journey, a little bit cocky thinking, oh, I've done this before. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but I got, like, I got this. I know what to expect. Um, and then <laughs> I was blindsided by a breakup, which is really hard to go through in the middle of a journey, yeah. being a public figure, being a public figure was really hard for me. And that's where I developed a new understanding of the power of emotional eating. Cause before I was eating the food, yeah, it tasted good, but I was eating the food to gain weight, right? That's kind of part of this journey. Eat the food, gain the weight. After going through a really hard breakup, which left me sad, lonely, and depressed. Food, specifically Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which is delicious and some wine and some other like chocolate that I had. It became this emotional thing where I was, I couldn't deal with the pain of being sad and lonely. So in those moments of eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream, there was this temporary relief from the pain that I was feeling in my life. And those little dopamine hits that I would get from the ice cream for me, honestly, was worth it in the moment. I'm not condoning that behavior because it's not healthy behavior, but I understood it at a deeper level because I actually went through something that caused me to emotionally eat, which made me temporarily feel better. And that what I'm saying is I understand better why people gravitate towards that because sometimes in life there's uncomfortable feelings or emotions that we have to deal with. And it's so much easier to gravitate towards like ice cream or wine to numb that pain instead of deal with it and face it because it's so uncomfortable. You know, we are a society of, of comfort, you know, anything that causes you discomfort, whether it's back pain, whether it's, you know, you're cold, you're hot, you're hungry, there is something at your fingertips to relieve all discomfort. Absolutely. And so now anytime there's any kind of discomfort in our life, we don't know how to deal with it. So we distract ourselves with social media or food or drugs or alcohol or sex or porn or TV shows or movies. And there's all these distractions that we have at our fingertips to make ourselves feel comfortable instantly, like instant gratification. And instead of dealing with the 
you know, uh, the, the hard emotions of like facing these painful, uncomfortable situations, like going to therapy, talking through it, working through it, having these hard conversations, people just, we don't want to, we don't want to do those hard things sometimes. And so that's kind of what I've learned uh, this time around, this second journey, you know, even deeper on a deeper level than I did when I did it back in 2011. Yeah, absolutely. When you were, uh, you know, emotionally eating, mm-hmm. Were you yes. like going to the uh, the grocery store saying, I'm in pain, so I'm going to go get these ice creams to make myself feel better? Or was it just like a, su- a, a subconscious thing? That's a good question. No, I was doing it intentionally. I knew I was aware of the emotions because I've done a lot of work on myself and a lot of a lot of like therapy and life coaching. So I'm aware of my emotions. And it was, I didn't have to go to the grocery store because my cupboard was full of it <laughs> so, or my pan or my roof, freezer had the ice cream. So I was like, I'm going to, like, I'm going to do this. And intentionally, I mean, it did help out the fact that I was doing this, this journey of gaining weight on purpose. Like, like had I not been going through that, it probably would have been a little bit different where I might've had some of that, but maybe not nearly as much as I did because I'm like, oh, I'm on this journey anyways. I'm going to let this food make me feel good. And yeah, it sucks. And I know this is unhealthy. This is an unhealthy habit I'm creating because to break it was really, really hard. Um, I knew that I was putting myself in a dangerous situation, um, yeah. you know, giving myself that drug of like of ice cream over and over again when I felt those sad emotions. Um, but ultimately, you know, it, I, I do know some things that have helped me get out of that. But at the same time, I knew how dangerous that was, even for someone like me that's aware of, has a lot of self-awareness. But there are people I can see who do that intentionally. They're like, screw it. I don't care. This sucks. I hate this. I hate myself. Why like why not? Like we kind of self-sabotage. We we beat ourselves up on the inside and then we eat yeah, the ice absolutely. cream. I'm not good makes enough. Us, I'm not good enough. Yeah, it makes us feel good temporarily. And then we feel like crap later. Then we guilt our shell ourselves and shame ourselves even more. And we then we create this vicious cycle and then it's hard to break free from that. So mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I can agree with that a lot. You know, when uh like the, I, the first chapter in the fit to fat the fit book, when you talk mm-hmm. about um, waking up overweight and walking down the dreaded stairs <laughs> to go get your toasted, whatever. <laughs> I was yeah. like, Oh my gosh, like I need to really change my diet. Cause <laughs> <laughs> again, I just like, I go in there to the gym, lift as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And, like I picked up bad habits. Like when, you know, when I got sober, I was like less than 130 pounds. So I was like, I just need to um, eat everything yeah, yeah. to gain weight. <laughs> um, and it, it's getting better through the years, but mm-hmm. by any means it's, if anyone who's listening to this, especially my old personal trainer, she will tell <laughs> you, uh, my diet is terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's just, it, your book was really relatable to me and I appreciate that. Thank you. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. You know, when, when you're not, you know, being a personal trainer, being a father, like, and pre COVID. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like what, what did you do in like your free time? What are some of your hobbies? Oh, that's a good question. Um, back before COVID, I loved to travel, uh, whether it was for business or for, you know, just being, uh, just for pleasure, whatever it was, I love traveling. Uh, but you know, for my hobbies and stuff like that, I would say, you know, I live here in Utah, lots of hiking you know, lots of beautiful scenery out here. I'm not a skier. I didn't grow up in Utah, so I didn't grow up skiing or snowboarding. So for me, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not, like, I can go and do it, but it's freaking hard. Um, but yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big like movie watcher. I love watching movies. So going to the movie theaters was way fun. Um, covid kind of ruined that a little bit (laughs) yeah uh let's see what else um hiking uh biking i took a biking just recently i'm not great at it but it you know it's faster than walking so it's that's good um and then you know i listen to a lot of podcasts and and books on like audible or you know listen like while i'm multitasking yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. what are some books that you would gift to someone man there's so many there's but like to name a few i would say like the very basics the first one would be if they haven't read it yet the four agreements i think every human should read that to understand these four agreements and what causes you so much suffering you know don't take things personally don't make assumptions you know always do your best be impeccable with your word these 
for you know agreements that can make a huge difference and once i read that book and learned it, i was like okay this is a very powerful lesson for me not to take things personally because you know we live on social media people take things personally all the time and we get so upset when someone disagrees with us on social media and you know has a differing opinion than than as you know heaven forbid that someone has a different opinion from us but anyways um Another good one that helps me is um, uh, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. That's a really good mm. one that helps me overcome a lot of guilt and shame. I think a lot of men struggle with guilt and shame because we're taught to man up and be men and, and be manly. And then when we have things that we you know make mistakes on, we don't know how to talk about it. So we just kind of suppress those those weaknesses and those those feelings so that we can be more manly, but ultimately it eats you up inside and I think it can break you. It broke me. Um, so that's, those are a couple that I would recommend. And then one more that just popped up is ego is the enemy by Brian holiday, kind of like helping you be aware of when your ego is involved and how much your ego causes you to suffer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I love Brene Brown's, uh, mm -hmm. Ted talk, the power yes. of vulnerability. Yes. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, <laughs> the four agreements, love that book, love the mastery of love. Yeah. Um, I had Dom Miguel Ruiz. That's Jr. a good one too. Um, oh, cool last summer which that was like super cool for me really? I, uh, that's awesome yeah <laughs> like i love reading his books and then just like having a conversation with him about the four agreements and the five agreements it was like it was super cool I, yeah i loved it um definitely and i'll have to check out the ego book i, I haven't yeah. heard of that one and who's yeah, the author ryan holiday ryan holiday okay yeah he's always he's got another one called the obstacle is, the obstacle is the way that's another really good book too mm have to check that out so what is something uh people can't google about you oh that's a good question <laughs> let me think about that one because i think pretty much everything is out there um well this is probably pre-google but i lived in brazil for two years i served a mission for the religion i grew up in uh, that i'm no longer a part of anymore but i i served a mission in brazil as a 19 year old kid which was one of the still coolest experiences of my life, like to be able to go to uh, another country, speak another language and like connect with people in a different culture was, I think every American teenager should travel to a third world country just to experience life outside of the United States. Like every teenager should go to a different country to see what this world is really about instead of like, complaining about wi-fi and traffic and their starbucks order you know what i'm saying like <laughs> <laughs> all these things all these things like yeah. i think every teenager should go to learn what it's like outside of this you know this little bubble yeah what was that experience like for you it was way cool to honest with honestly i was really scared i used to be really shy and this kind of brought me out of that shell of being really shy because i had to go talk to people as part of like my job i had to connect with people and talk yeah. to them and and then speak it in another language it was so humbling. Like the first six months sucked. I cried a lot. I would go home and just be so frustrated because as an athlete, you kind of pride yourself on picking things up quickly and getting, yeah. getting in and understanding it. Language is a whole nother ball game because that's a mental game. But to eventually get fluent, become fluent in it was one of the coolest things to be able to express yourself, to show people your personality in another language is so hard to do. But I, and it was really cool that I had that experience as a, as a teenager. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the people, the culture, the food, the music, everything about the country of Brazil was so, I just loved, I adored everyone that was there and the culture and the people are so nice. And man, it's just, it's just a breath of fresh air. And I haven't been back since, to be honest with you, I need to go back to Brazil, but um, I loved, I loved it. That would be super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe cool. when COVID's <laughs> over, yeah. I, I can go to Brazil. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly oh man it uh anyways i'm so over talking about COVID with everyone <laughs> I, know, I know uh I yeah so you know but go back to like your 14 year old version of yourself mm -hmm. and if you could go back and tell a 14 year old version of yourself three tips of life advice what would those three things be yeah Oh man, the first one would be stop caring what other people think about you. Like I obsessed over that and was so worried about what other people thought about me to the point where I didn't even really know who I was because I would do things to please anyone so that they would like me, right? Uh, so that would be the first thing. The second thing would be 
to uh, tell myself that vulnerability is a strength. Mm -hmm. And instead of like vulnerability is a weakness and man up and hide those feelings, no, learn to be vulnerable now and um, it'll change your life. And I think the third thing I would say to myself is, you know, discover who you really are. And what I mean by that is don't be afraid to really figure out who you are, you know, outside of who you're told to be. I didn't really understand that, like what the difference was, like who am I versus whom I'm being told to be. I think as humans, we're kind of domesticated from a very young age of what's good, what's bad, what's, you know, what's naughty, what's nice. Like we're taught how to behave in this world uh, based off of our parents and the culture they grew up in and, and society and teachers and coaches and TV shows and books and movies and music kind of mold us and experience and, and like shape us into who we are. And so it's really hard to figure out who you are without all that. And so like just telling myself to have the courage to, you know, explore, you know, who I am and discover who I am. Mm, I like that. I like that okay. a lot. Mm. So you got a new book out, The Complete yes. Keto. You want to talk about yes, that? Right. Yeah, for sure. So Fit to Fat to Fit was the first book that I wrote after my first Fit to Fat to Fit experiment. And then I stumbled upon keto in like 2015 or so. and ended up falling in love with it, went on Dr. Oz again a second time to talk about the benefits of the keto diet, started writing programs and started you know, changing people's lives with it. And then I got approached with the opportunity to write a, a, a keto book, but I, I wanted to make it different instead of just making it about just keto. <laughs> I wanted to take the lessons I learned from fit to fat to fit and plug it into a, a book you know, about keto. So yes, there's a keto section of here's how to do keto, here's how it works, here's the meal plans and the recipes and all that stuff, right? You can get that in any, in any book. But the mental and emotional stuff, which is what I think people struggle with the most when it comes to transformation, I add in a lot of tips and tricks and hacks for people to overcome emotional eating or overcome other emotional issues that keep them from living a healthy lifestyle consistently uh, in hopes to help them with a complete transformation, not just a physical transformation, because honestly, you, you can lose weight on any diet out there. Um, but the cool thing with with my approach is helping people on the mental, emotional, even spiritual side sometimes with this complete transformation. And that's where a lifestyle, uh, that's where it becomes a lifestyle change instead of just another diet. And so that's yeah. kind of what my book, Complete Keto, is about is, yeah, it has all the physical stuff you need that we have talked about, like eat healthy food and that, that stuff. Uh, but also on the mental, emotional side, helping people with the mindset aspect of it. Mm, I like that. Like. I don't know about you, but I can go into a store and there will and there will be like keto this, keto that. Is there anything <laughs> yes. that like somebody should look out for for like bad keto and good keto, not just like a marketing? Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good question. I actually did an experiment with that on my fit to fat to forty journey of uh, when I was gaining weight. I actually did a dirty version of keto. Um, also did a dirty version of paleo, vegan, and vegetarian, but we'll stick with just keto to kind of educate people on what not to do. Like if you're going to do a keto, don't do it this way. And I actually, you know, uh, didn't become healthier during that phase, even though I was in ketosis. Um, so a lot of the foods that I focus on, people tend to overdo a couple of food items. One is dairy. So they add cream, whipping cream, cheese to almost every dish. And they think it's just a lot of, they think it's a lot of butter, bacon, and cheese. Like, okay, no carbs, cool. I'm gonna eat butter, bacon, and cheese all day long. And, and then people tend to over consume dairy. And then also they snack on nuts and seeds because they're so, you know, they're low carb-ish in small amounts, but then, you know, like the, so, the roasted salted cashews or like the pistachios or like the uh, macadamia nuts. And yeah, sure, if you can eat a small amount of those, cool, stick with that but they're so salty and like pleasurable, you just keep eating them. So those are two food groups that, that I overconsumed during this little experiment. And then from there, it's a lot of like, um, you know, sugar-free energy drinks or diet sodas, and they drink more of that than they do water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like all these other chemicals in your body probably aren't gonna help you. I'm not saying artificial sweeteners are like awful for you. I have them every once in a while. But yeah, not all the time. And then the other things are the, the keto products that you see at the store, breads, tortillas, waffles, pancakes, cookies, donuts, ice cream, like all the keto stuff that exists out, out there now because of these marketing tools, there's a time and place for those things. 
The problem is that people gravitate towards those comfort foods because they're like, well, I have to have a cookie. I have to have ice cream. It's like, okay, now I'm going to get a keto version of that, which has twice the amount of calories because it's got more fat in it. And so now you're, <laughs> now you're eating all these processed, um, you know, keto treats. And before you know it, you're like, oh, well, I'm still doing, I'm still in ketosis. It's like, yeah, but you know, you're not losing weight. You're not losing fat. You're actually gaining weight. Probably you're gaining fat and you're not becoming healthier. And so if you are going to do keto, that's why my book complete keto is a good place to start because it's a whole food approach. All the recipes in there are dairy free and nut free, not saying you should, you can't eat those, but yeah. just limited quantities. Um, and, and stick with mostly whole foods. Sure, there's a, maybe like once a week, have like a piece of keto cake and see if it tastes good. It probably isn't even as good as the real thing. So, you know, save that for a special occasion. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, how I demonstrated uh, not to do keto. Mm, absolutely love it. Love it. Mm-hmm. And is it on Audible? It is on Audible, but the only problem with Audible is you can't see the recipes in there, or like I don't read off the recipes on Audible. Fair enough. That's so you're, you're missing out. Up. Yeah, you're missing out <laughs> the recipes and the meal plan structure when you get the Audible version. But you could get the Audible and then just listen to the book part and then skip ahead to the physical part in the book where it's just the recipes and meal plans. Perfect. There you go. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when people are looking for a personal trainer, what are some things that they should look out for? Mm. That's a good question. You know, I've never I've been asked that actually. Um, you know, for me, I prefer someone. Well, first of all, let me let me tell you a quote, and it's by Theodore Roosevelt. He says, "No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care." And so, if you're someone that's looking for a trainer, see and feel how much you feel they care about you, and do they even care about you know you other than hey, I'm going to help you lose weight. Um, you know, leading with empathy is really important for me. And this is why I'm trying to create a new breed of trainers. I created a fit to fat to fit certification course for other coaches who want to be part of this movement that want to lead with empathy. Uh, there's some training that I've created this curriculum to help trainers become more empathetic. And so, um, someone that can lead with empathy, someone that it doesn't necessarily need, uh, they didn't need to be overweight at some point in their life. I think that's beneficial though, because they have a better understanding for the most part, not all trainers, but for the most part, they have a better understanding of the mental and emotional struggle that comes with actually losing weight versus someone that's been in shape their entire life might not be able to understand how hard it is for you, the the person who's overweight of the struggle that you're about to go through. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Um, So that's, that's a a bonus, I guess, if they do have, if they have been overweight at some point in time. Um, and, uh, but yeah, still, I mean, some of that can be empathetic, empathetic, I think is something to look for and that understands your struggle and that truly cares about you as a human. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Not just somebody who wants to take your money and yeah. here you go online and you know, uh, yeah. let's check in maybe once a month. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or someone that just has all the certifications. That's almost too smart that where they like, they have all the knowledge but they just don't know how to connect with you. They don't know how to relate to you on a uh, deeper emotional level. That is really important too. Like, don't just go for someone that has the most certifications. Don't go for someone that just has the most knowledge because that doesn't always equate to success uh, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, definitely feel them out. Interview them as much as they're interviewing you when you like are thinking about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What do you think are some questions that, I, a client should ask a potential trainer. Yeah, maybe say, have you ever been overweight before? Um, do you know what it's like to lose a lot of weight? Um, have you ever been addicted to food? Or have you ever emotionally ate? Um, do you know what empathy is? <laughs> you know, do you understand? <laughs> do you understand what empathy is? Uh, you know, I think those are good questions, to be honest with you. I just made those up, but, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to think about that, so. That yeah, that's why it's storytelling from the heart. Yes, exactly. So, uh, Drew, now I got a couple last questions for you. Okay. One, where can people find you? Okay, super simple. Fit to fat to fit with the number two. So fit, number two, fat, number two, fit.com. All my social media handles are all the same. Awesome. Okay, right on. And where can they buy your books? Uh, Amazon. Amazon, simple enough. Yep. Yeah, okay. Super simple. <laughs> now, what is your message to the world? Mm. Well, a few different messages. 
I would say because I work in the health and fitness industry, this world needs more empathy. Uh, the fitness industry needs more empathy, but this world needs more empathy, especially after what happened in 2020, how divisive things became. Uh, that's why I wanted to do this a second time was because I felt like the, the fitness industry definitely needed more empathy, but seeing the divisiveness, the politics and, and race and, and the pandemic online, it, if we truly could develop empathy and listen to understand people, this world would be a much better place. Instead, we're so quick to judge. We're so quick to belittle people and um, you know, not truly listen to them. I feel like it's making this world more divided. So I, I would say probably that. Love it. Right on, Drew. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks Thank so you much, for Robert. being on.